Good morning, church. And if you, depending on how old you are today, you may or may not understand this illustration, but I grew up in a little town called Akron, Ohio. And by the way, I was there before LeBron James, so just saying. And uh, when I was around, I don't even remember exactly, maybe 10 or 11 years old, one of our favorite local radio stations got bought out, WKDD. And uh, I would listen to it every morning back when I was a kid. That would be what you would have your alarm clock wake you up to, kick on, and that would be turned on. And, and that was just like my sister and I, that was our jam. Okay, well, they got bought out. And as a part of getting bought out, they played this little song on repeat all day for I think it was like a day, maybe two days. It was R.E.M.'s, It's the End of the World as We Know It. Do you guys remember this song? Anybody remember that? Now you're welcome all day long. You'll be going, na, 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 na. you don't know any of the words. And they go, it's the end of the world as we know it. Well, here's what happened. I went to school that day, and all of us who also woke up to WKDD, we would all, wake, we would all talk all day long like, is this really the end of the world? Like, is this it? Like, do they know something the rest of us don't know? And they're announcing it. And literally, people were scouring the other news sites. We didn't have the internet back then. Al Gore had not yet created it. And so, (laughs) thank you for those of you who think that's funny. Anyway, so the whole point was, like, we all thought this was it. They're telling us this is the end of the world. Because when you don't know what to look for, you'll take any sign as it. I remember the first time I saw a red moon and I didn't understand blood moons. And I thought, oh, this is it, this is it. Every time there's like an eclipse or something, oh, maybe this is it, maybe this is it. Well, what I wanna do for the next two weeks is tell you what you need to know and what you need to understand before Jesus returns. But here's the thing. So if you've been looking forward to this, because I've been telling you for a couple of months, we're going to spend two weeks talking about the second return of Jesus and the end of the world. If you're so excited, you just need to know you're going to feel so let down after today, because I am not one of those internet preachers who's going to make millions of dollars talking about the end of the world. There has been a ton of money made on this. There are websites, entire websites dedicated to false predictions on the return of Jesus Christ. There's a man who wrote a book called 88 Reasons to Believe Jesus is going to Return in 1988. Guess what didn't happen in 1988? So he wrote a book in 1989. Guess what he called it? 89 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1989. By 1990, he stopped writing books because nobody would listen to him anymore. Anybody in the business of predicting the day and the hour of Jesus' return will not be in business for very long. Although, if you want to be seen as an accurate prophet, just guess every day, every day, and sooner or later you'll be right, and then you can say, see, I told you so. Come on, that's a little funny. But anyway, (laughs) here's what we're going to do. We're going to hold today with a ton of humility. I made joke from time to time about being right and other people being wrong, but it's truly a joke. These are hard subjects. They are hard, and I have spent, and this is not an exaggeration, probably over 150 hours over the last 10 to 15 years studying this, and it's still hard. And I'm sitting in a room with some other guys on staff who've looked into this, and I'm going, this is hard. I mean, no matter how many times I look at it, it's hard. So, it's hard. And I will tell you where I land, and I will tell you why I land there. And if you disagree with me, that's great. This is in what we call the the tertiary topics. It's so far down the the list, you don't have to agree with me to go to heaven. You just have to agree with me to be right. Other than that, you don't (laughs) have... Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's like a really uncomfortable chuckle. Okay. It's like your spouse, right? That's what they think. So here's what we're going to do. We've been walking through the book of Luke. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 17. And then I'm going to be all over the Bible for a little bit. And then I'm going to bring us back to a point at the end. So that's where we're going. Stick with me. I'll do my best to make sense of it. Luke chapter 17. Here's where we're starting. Once I'm being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's an important idea. Before I can dig deep into the second return of Jesus, I have to first help you understand what Jesus is talking about, what he's saying, and what that means for you. If you open up your Bible app, which I always recommend, I really love the Bible app. Life Church has done a phenomenal job of that. You can find every translation you could think of in the world inside there. If you open that up in the NIV, 
and you look at this verse, you'll see a little drop down at the bottom. See, it says 1721, or is within you. It's a complex Greek phrase. Nobody knows exactly the best translation. The idea is the kingdom of God is here. Well, when did the kingdom of God show up? Well, it showed up when Jesus showed up. But there was this constant building of that kingdom as Jesus is walking among us, as he's here among us. But that little implication is it's here amidst you, among you, but it's also not just among you, it's here in you. It's inside you. The kingdom of God is not in a building. If this building burns to the ground, the kingdom of God called Kingsway still exists. Why? Because you are the kingdom of God. Because the people of God are marked by the presence of God. The people of God are marked by the presence of God. And this was a massive change in world history. This is what we call the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, we give our lives to Jesus Christ. We become united with him. What happens is God fills us with himself. So we are now living, breathing, walking temples of God. This is exactly what Paul's trying to get to in 1 Corinthians 6. And when he says, don't you know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? You are a living, breathing, active, moving temple of God. So that now wherever you go, there's God. Because he is not just with you, he's in you. Massive difference. That was never true at any point in history. And by the way, you don't, I don't, ah, someday I'm going to do a whole thing on this. Again, I've done it before. We don't realize what that means. The blessing, the power of God's spirit in us all the time. All the time, all the time. That's what Peter's trying to get to, 1 Peter 2, 5, when he says, and you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And see, you've maybe heard that passage before. You're like, yeah, that sounds like a lot of Bible words. What does he mean? Well, let me show you what he means. So here's a picture of modern day uh, Jerusalem. And you'll notice in this picture, that big gold thing, hang on to that. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if you go directly below that big gold thing and to the right, see those big stones there? That's actually the Western wall of what was the Temple Mount. Here's a picture of me and Israel standing in front of it with my black golfing hat on, and I actually looked like one of the Jewish men walking around, but that was an accident as it happened that day. You could see a man there covered in his prayer shawl. He is praying. This is called the Wailing Wall. If you see that hole in the wall behind me, I have a zoomed in picture, but you get it. There are all kinds of little pieces of paper stuck inside that crack in the wall because many Jewish people today are praying for God to rebuild and restore the temple. And so they pray on pieces of paper and they stick them in there. And every day they clear these out and it starts over. And day after day after day after day after day, these Jewish people come to this wall because this is the wall where the temple used to stand. And this is what Peter's referring to when he says, you like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. The whole idea is you as an individual are now the temple of the presence of God. This is so critical because when we read many what we consider to be end times texts in the Bible, We read them through a very 21st century Americanized view that interprets everything through the lens of some future date when Jesus is going to return. Instead of a future date that already occurred somewhere in history. And before you freak out, I do believe Jesus is going to return one day. Jesus was speaking prophetically but he was speaking prophetically about something that was about to happen, not something that would happen at the end of time. And I know that's confusing because of books like uh, the Left Behind series, most of us don't have any context for the end of the world outside of R.E.M. song. We see a couple cataclysmic movies, and so we think, oh, what's it gonna be like? Is it gonna be nuclear war or helicopters? What's going to happen? And we don't know history very well. Most of us don't. 
And we don't know our Bible super well, and so we don't know how to marry those two things. And because there is a, <clears throat> a vein of Christianity that interprets these different than me. And look, at the end of the time, we might find out Matt was totally wrong, and that'd be okay on this subject for me to be wrong, because it's not a theology issue, it's an interpretation issue. But I'm telling you where I land because we've heard something. It's been popularized. We've made movies about it because it sells a lot of books. And so it's what's in our heads. All four passages that I have kind of showed you and want to look at today, Luke 17, Luke 19, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13, they all describe, at least in part, they're referring to a prophetic moment when God is going to vindicate Jesus and judge Israel. Both pieces of that are critical to understand what's happening. Vindicate Jesus, judge Israel. The reason I say vindicate Jesus, Jesus, first of all, in order for him to be a prophet, which he is that and so much more, in order to be a prophet, his prophecies must come true. Sometimes prophecies take a long time before they come true. Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Jesus, but he had a number of prophecies that came true of Jesus. So just because a prophet says something that dies doesn't mean he's wrong. A prophet has to be right, though, in what he says. So number one is going to vindicate him because not only that, but it's going to vindicate everything he said about who he was, he has to be right about also. And the reason it's going to judge Israel is because Jesus came and offered his life to everybody in Israel. When Paul began his ministry, he said, I go first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, to extend uh, the opportunity for every Jewish person to respond to Jesus. But not responding to Jesus is going to end very, very poorly for Israel. Because God did judge them. Now, let me show you some of these texts. I'll explain it a little bit more. I hope to put the bow on it and make sense of it so you can walk away. You don't have to be a scholar. You just have to get some of these big handles in place. Let's look at some of these texts. Again, Luke 17, Luke 19, Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13. Now you're opening your Bible and reading them all. Here we go. If you, even you, I'm gonna wait till they go to the next slide. Catch up to me here. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Go back one. I'm sorry. Did I jump ahead of myself? Go back one for me. I'm looking at this. Uh, Yeah, sorry. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Interesting, right? So here, Luke 19, what Jesus is talking about, he's saying to them, look, if my disciples keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Isn't that interesting in light of that he's now saying, we who follow Jesus are the stones. Then he goes on and he says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you... The people in the city, if you had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You read that, you go, whoa, it's going to be bad at the end. Well, it is, but he's not referring to a date yet in the future for us. He's referring to a date that is in the future for him. Let me show you again, Luke 21. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when will not One stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Again, Matthew 24. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So hang on, keep that slide up there for a second. When will this happen? What will be the sign of the end of the age? Jesus has asked two different questions, and I land in the camp that says the way Jesus answers understands he's speaking of two separate moments. He's answering question one, and then he answers question two. And that's what you see in Matthew 24 and in Matthew 25. And the hard part does become where does he stop answering question one, and where does he start answering question two? That's not 
for today's message. But the text that I've seen shown you in 17, Luke 17, 19, 21, then Matthew 24, Mark 13, there's a consistency that I want to show you. So first it said, while sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is where we get what's called the Olivet Discourse. The Mount of Olives is the garden where Jesus goes in to pray before the night that he's arrested, or the night that he's arrested, not before, before he's arrested, the night of his arrest. Let me show you a view from that very garden looking towards Jerusalem. Here's what this looks like today. This is a picture you find on the internet. Do you see that golden dome again? That is a Muslim mosque, the same one you saw in the other picture, and it sits on top of the Temple Mount. If you look below that, you see some trees. If you look below that, you see the wall. That is a rebuilt, or some of it's ancient, but rebuilt and ancient version of the wall that surrounded Jerusalem. You can go ahead and come back off that picture. That's what Jesus was looking at, except for where that golden dome was, at the time, was the temple. I don't think I have enough time to get you to buy into what I'm about to say in a way that makes sense. But the Jewish people, their hope was in their temple because the temple was the house of God. The temple was the place that they gathered for worship and the sacrifices were made and the priests and the high priests mediated between God and man there. The reason we know that we are going to win everything is because God is with us. God is in us. And what they mean by that is not in us in the way that we mean. They mean in this building. Jesus goes on in Mark 13, and I'm just pulling passages to show you how it's all similar. He says, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Meaning you can trust everything I'm saying. The reason all of that is critical, is this generation becomes a very highly debated phrase among godly men and women who disagree. But the most natural reading of this generation is this generation, the generation I'm speaking to. These words that Jesus spoke in Mark 13 happened around A.D. 30. A generation in Jesus' day was 40 years. 40 years is a generation, hence why the Israelites wandered in the desert in Exodus for 40 years. In 70 A.D., after, depending on exactly how you count it, after a seven-year war, there was a three-and-a-half-year intensity to it where Rome came and surrounded the city, literally laid siege to Jerusalem. This is called the First Roman-Jewish War. Some people say Jewish-Roman War. It was an intense battle like you have never seen. The Romans built a wall around the wall to trap the Jews inside. They cut off all access to resources, even though the Jews had some underground water that the Romans didn't know about. It took a long time for them to figure that out so they could keep getting resources. Things got so bad in the city, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Without going into graphic detail, parents ate their own children. This is all in history, guys. I didn't make this up. It's worse than any movie you could think of. It makes sense then in places like Daniel 9 and others, even Matthew 24, that Jesus talks about a suffering that is unlike anything the world has ever seen or will know since then. It was bad. It was really bad. But here's what's really fascinating. Historians actually record. These are non-Christian historians, which means there wasn't a motive for a Christian. You can't say the Christian authors had a reason to write this. Non-Christian authors actually record when the Christians who had heard all these things Jesus was saying, when they saw Rome surrounding the city, they believed it. And they got out of there. Luke 17, 22. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. So this is where Coming back for just a second, 
The Jews of Jesus' day believed Jesus. They believed that he was returning. He, they believed everything he said was actually going to happen. And so they listened to him. And when they saw Rome surrounding the city, they got out of there. So the Jews became judged, but the Christians believed Jesus and were saved. This is why Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, I've longed to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks. I've longed to protect you. I've longed to keep you safe, but you wouldn't trust me. You wouldn't listen to me. You didn't believe me. I could have saved you. And now Jesus is coming back to Luke 17. Now Jesus is telling them, there's a day that's coming, though, that I'm not going to be here anymore, and you're going to long to see me. You're going to long to know me. You're going to long for that. Verse 23 he says, people will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them. Don't go. In this time frame, from the time the, the war began, it depends, you count whether it's 63 or 66, depending on which part of the war you're counting is the beginning of the war. From that time, there were so many messiahs who rose up. Tons of them. Google this later if you don't believe me. It's all there for you to see. History records all this. They aren't real messiahs. They're false messiahs. And what they're saying to Jews, the Jews is, if you follow me, I will lead you to victory over Rome because they were looking for a king who would overthrow the powers that be. But remember, the kingdom isn't out there. The kingdom is in here. Jesus goes on. He says, for the son of man in his day will be like lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, but the day at Lot, day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. All. In other words, Jesus is prepping the people. This is how serious you need to take this. You need to think about Noah for a second. It's a great analogy. Everybody in Noah's day, he's building a boat and they're just ignoring it. And then one day it was time, all these animals are going out to the boat. People are like, well, that's weird. What's happening there? But they didn't do anything about it. And then one day the door shut, the rain started, and everybody went, ah, Noah was right. Same thing with Lot. Lot took his family and they got out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the fire came down from heaven. But as they're going away, Lot's wife for one second just wanted to look. Even though Lot's wife was told, do not turn around. Just in haste, go, run. But she stopped and she got burned up also. Now, all of that is perfect for Jesus because he's saying, when you see this day coming, you need to get out of here immediately. Oh, and he says, I think it's in Matthew 24, he says, you need to pray that you're not pregnant when that day comes. You need to pray it's not snowing on that day. But I'm telling you, don't go down in your house and grab anything. Don't go back. Just take your family, get out of there immediately. There will be no time. They will spare no one. Leading up to the return of Jesus to judge Israel, life on earth will be going on as usual. And let me give you a little foretaste of next week. And I'm convinced that's what life will be like on earth before Jesus returns the second time. There'll be people eating and drinking and giving into marriage and going about their daily business or driving their car and they have no idea what's about to come upon them. We'll get to that. Luke 17. And it will be like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Because whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. In context, what Jesus is saying is, if you try to go gather your stuff, you're going to die. It's going to be over. You're not going to have time for that. When you see these things happening, get out of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, he goes on, I tell you, on that night, two people will be in, in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. I wish we'd all been ready. So you have to be around in the 70s, be a Jesus freak in the 70s to get that one. All right. Or DC talk again in the 90s. Either way. Okay. So I, I land in the camp. And listen, I humbly land in the camp. It says this verse is not 
necessarily talking about the second return of Jesus in that sense. It's talking about 70 AD. Now, is it possible Matt Nicholson is wrong? Absolutely. It's happened one time before. Probably it's gonna happen again. And as I've told you before, the one time I was wrong, it's actually I was right, it's, but I thought I was wrong, so I was wrong. And so, you know, maybe one day. Okay, in all seriousness, I land in this camp, not because I don't believe Jesus is coming back. I do believe Jesus is coming back. But I don't believe that's what this passage is referring to when it says it. I want you to get that. I'm gonna quote a guy named John Whitaker. Uh, I'd like to have him out here someday to teach us. He's, great. He's got a great podcast it's basically Bible college teaching, very quick. He calls it blue jeans theology because he wants to do deep, heady theology for everyday people. And if you go to the podcast, any podcast store, whether Apple or, or Google or whatever, um, you'll find just, he's got 30, 40 minutes on every single one of these texts. It's really good stuff. He says this, followers of Jesus fled Jerusalem before its siege by the Romans and its destruction. The records of history show that there were no Christians in Jerusalem at that time because they took Jesus' words to heart. In other words that he said, and when they saw what was happening, they said, we're out of here, and they fled the city. And you're like, this is a great history lesson, man, I don't care. <laughs> I know, stick with me, and I'll give you a nugget before we really get into the fun stuff next week. So Luke 17, 37, where, Lord, they asked, and he replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Okay. So there's two ways, I think, to best look at this text of what Jesus is saying. First of all, where do vultures gather? Where something is dead. Okay, so that, that seems to fit. What Jesus then, if that is the best interpretation, what Jesus is saying is where something is dying, that's where you're going to see vultures. So they're saying, where is this going to happen? What he's saying, where is there something dead? I mean, he's been preaching against putting your faith in the Pharisees and in the rabbis and in their teachings. He's been calling everybody to faith in himself. And he's saying, life is found in me. Death is found over here. Follow me, find life. Follow them, find death. If that's the best interpretation, he's saying, you're gonna find this where there's death. What do I keep saying where death is? It's right here. It's right here. It's not in me. Find me, find life. The problem is the word vulture is just a Greek word that refers to big birds of prey, not big bird, big birds of prey, which is why the King James Version says the same verse this way. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? And he said unto them, wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Notice that they don't put vultures, they put what? Eagles. And fascinating, if this is the other possible interpretation, guess what the symbol for Romans are? Eagles. As to exactly which word is the best word for our English translation, the Greek word is just generic enough to say birds of prey. So what it means is Jesus was giving you all the clues in the world you would need to figure out what it is he's talking about when he says it. It was a prophetic event, but for him it was 40 years in the future, not thousands of years in the future. Now here's the point that I want you to walk away with. You're like, I'm glad I came to church. I got a history lesson. No, you're not. Unless you're a history junkie like me, you don't care. But here's the stuff I want you to care about. Let's come back to Luke 17, 21 real quick. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or remember, is within you. Whatever exactly the end times is going to look like, if there is yet to be a man of lawlessness or an antichrist to be revealed, if AI is going to create some sort of thing and allow this man to take over the world, if nuclear war is on the brink of breaking out between Russia or China and the United States, if there is yet to be an intense season of suffering and persecution like the world has never seen or known, you still need to know God's kingdom is available for you today. It's exactly what Paul's trying to build to. When he says this in Ephesians chapter one, he says, I keep asking that the God of our father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, sorry, the glorious father may give you the spirit 
of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. See, whatever you learn or don't learn about today or next week when we really talk end times fun stuff, the goal is to know him better. And I pray, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. There's a hope available in Jesus Christ that is yours today. Does it really matter if Jesus is going to return in, say, 10 years? If you have cancer today, or you die in a car accident next week, there's a a gentleman who has helped to coach us through an organization called the Unstuck Group. That's the group that we hired to create our uh, five-year vision that we are now living in year four of, I believe. The guy who started the company Unstuck is Tony Morgan. And I believe I'm saying this correctly. A few weeks ago at 55 years old, he had a massive heart attack. It died a few days later. At 55, the dude was in really good shape. I mean, he wasn't like Ben Bullard shape, but he was in good shape. Then again, who is? I guarantee you he did not have in his schedule that day. Have a heart attack. See, nobody knows the day or the hour. And what is available to us today is the comfort and the peace of the presence of God. Paul goes on, he says, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's what's available to us. The the inheritance of heaven is available to us, not in some future thing when God comes. It's available to us today, right here, right now. In verse 19, in his incomparably great power for us who believe, incomparably great, that power that is available to us is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The same power that rose a dead man from the grave is in you if you believe in Jesus Christ. It's in you. Again, I don't know how to make this any more powerful from you, but when you start reading news articles and you hear pastors and people talk about end times and things, like listen to it, read it, enjoy it, study it, but all of it is secondary to what is in you. What is in you is God himself, the power that rose Jesus from the grave is in you. You are the church. You are the temple of God. You are the priest mediating a new covenant between heaven and earth. You are a walking, living, breathing presence of God. He is in you. He is in your midst. He is with you right here, right now, no matter what you face, no matter what tomorrow holds. Look at verse 21. And that what's in you is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. In Jesus' day, and still happens all over the world, we just don't see it as much in America. People would invoke names of deities and those names had power. I mean, crazy things were often happening. We know, Paul says, all these deities, there's no other God but God. All these other deities are just demons masquerading as deities. So when you invoke a name of another God, another deity, what you're really invoking is a demonic force. And this was so normal. There was so much spiritual activity in the first century that it's actually written about. These two Roman senators, not Christian, Roman senators are writing back and forth. And one of them claims, I think the number is 70. He says there are 70 Christians that the church has hired at one point in history to deal with these demons. Make sure you don't get rid of all your Christians or you will have nobody left to deal with the evil things happening among your people. Is that not awesome? The church has the power of God living inside it. Ephesians 1, 22, though, says this. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything. For why? The church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. See, you don't have a building out of a stone, do you? It takes a number of stones to build a building. That's part of the analogy. While I am a walking temple and God is in me, it takes me along with the rest of the body to build a building. God is building a temple to dwell in, and it's us together. So before I can really come back and talk to you about end time stuff, you need to know this. God is right here, right now. The hope of heaven is yours right here, right now. The peace that is, that is in heaven, it could be inside you right here, right now. The hope of a future eternity that's coming, yes, it's solidified right here, right now in this thing called the church. This lie that is out there today, I don't need to be engaged in the church. I'll just stay home and watch church. It is a lie from the pit of hell. The church was never a screen The church was always the walking, breathing, living body of Christ together saying, I'm not everything. I'm just a finger or I'm a toe or I'm a hand or an arm or whatever I am, right? I'm just a part of a bigger thing that God is doing on the earth, but he's doing his presence is here in me. His presence is here with me and in with us. When you're sitting at home in bed and you aren't feeling so good, and you're like, I don't know, I think I'm gonna skip this week. Get your butt out of bed. You're talking about the living, breathing, active presence of God on earth. When you're sitting there going, I don't know, but my kids have baseball on Sunday morning. Who cares? We'll all play baseball together for eternity in heaven and I'll finally be good. It'll be great. But in the meantime, you're walking into the presence of God among others who are the living, breathing, act. And I get it. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I know, but church is just so boring. Are you kidding me? It's because you don't understand what's in you. We may not always put on a great show. You might sometimes have to have a long history lesson. But it's the presence of heaven, the power of heaven the wisdom and the knowledge and the beauty and the glory of heaven. It's here in you and right here, right now. Like, don't take this for granted. Look forward to it. Be like, I get to go be a part of heaven today. It's already the kingdom of the already and the not yet. It's mine. It's not all mine. One day in heaven, evil will be removed. One day in heaven, all tears will be wiped away. One day in heaven, there'll be reconciliation between that which is broken. One day in heaven, the demons will be cast out. But one day in heaven, so will everybody who were never received Jesus on earth. That's all I'm calling on you to consider end times to think about your life and how brief that it is and say, God, what do I need to do with today, with this moment to bring heaven to earth? And as you're doing that, look, at any point, if you're watching at home online, you're here right now, you could text the word connect, C-O-N-N-E-C-T to the number 317-565-4911. Or if you're here in this room, when we leave today, you can go outside these doors, go to our Connect Hub and say, I need to quit playing games with God. I need to quit dating him and I need to marry him. What do I do next? And they'd love to help you. For the rest of us, we're gonna sing. And here's what I want you to have in your mind. We're gonna sing a new song today that we're gonna add into our worship services. So today's like the day you're gonna learn it. And that's okay that you won't know it yet. But here's what I want you to picture as you're singing this song. I don't want you to picture it's the last day. And Jesus has returned and he's called all of us dead and alive to join him. And there's a heavenly throne room. And God the Father and Jesus the Son are seated on their throne. And there's this beautiful bow of light over top. And the elders have laid down their crowns before him and and knelt before him. And the angels, thrones upon thrones of angels, so many multitudes, you can't even count them all. They're all singing with this loud voice. 
and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And I want you to think for a minute, how are you gonna feel in that moment? How are you gonna feel in the presence of all that power and all that holiness? How are you gonna feel? And if there's any guilt, if there's any shame, if there's anything in your conscience that's not clean, then I want you to cast it down and give it to him right now. Because Romans chapter eight, verse one says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So if you need to be in Christ Jesus, get your act together and get in Christ Jesus, but stand there with hands held high, say he alone is holy. Let's all stand, I'll pray and we'll sing. Surround us with your presence, Father. You are already here in us, in our midst. Father, I pray that you would um, give us a glimpse of heaven that's so compelling that we would act and live differently as a result. Receive our worship now. As we learn this new song, God, may our hearts be unified with the words in Jesus' name.